Now, when you talk about legacies in this life, some legacies are uh, thrust upon us by genealogy, others we acquire by achievement and our life path. Well, the individual with me today, Kenneth Morris Jr., is really an amalgamation of both of these legacies, one by his own works and two by the genealogy or the, what was bequeathed to him from his most distinguished ancestors. First, I want to welcome Kenneth to the show. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you, Bill, for having me on. Yes, now, as I look into your studio there, I can see the ancestors smiling back at me, one of whom is right over your head, and that is Booker T. Washington, who was famously the founder of Tuskegee Institute and was probably the most prominent African-American figure on the American scene from about, uh, I would say, the 1890s till his death in 1915. And then, let's see, behind you, next to Martin Luther King and Barack Obama, I see the uh, rather severe face <laughs> of Frederick Douglass. And yes. what I've read, and as I understand it, and you can tell me more, you are a direct genealogical descendant of both of these men. Tell me about that. I absolutely am. And as you're describing the images behind me, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're smiling <laughs> because no. they had serious work to do. And we can talk about Frederick Douglass's uh, photo legacy and how strategic he was in presenting himself as a man worthy of freedom, worthy of citizenship. But I am the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass. And I'm also the great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington and the way that the two families came together happened on my mom's side of the family. So my mother's mother, Nettie Hancock Washington, was Booker T. Washington's granddaughter. And my mother's father, Frederick Douglass III, was Frederick Douglass's great grandson. And so my grandparents met in 1941 at Tuskegee Institute, which, as you mentioned, was a school that Booker T. Washington founded in 1881. They happened to be on campus the same day. My, my grandmother had been born in the hospital on campus, but was living in California at the time. She just happened to be home for summer vacation. And my grandfather was a surgeon and he had been commissioned down there by the Veterans Administration during World War II. And so my grandmother was rushing to meet friends on the other side of campus. My grandfather was headed to get something to eat in the cafeteria and they literally bumped into each other. Didn't know that the other descended from an historic family and they fell in love at first sight, wound up getting married three months later. <laughs> And uh, when my mom was born, Nettie Washington Douglas, and my mom lives in Atlanta, um, when she was born, she was the first person to unite the bloodlines of these two families. And my mom was an only child. So when she married my father, Kenneth Moore Sr., I was the first male to carry the dual lineage. So that's how the families collided, as we like to say, in, in our family. Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass, their own lives intersected, although Frederick Douglass was born about 30 years earlier, 1818, 1817, than Booker T. Washington, who was born in 1856, both right. into slavery, as I might add. But Tell me, did their lives converge in real time? They absolutely converged in real time. In fact, they were friends. Mm -hmm. And Frederick Douglass spoke down at Tuskegee for a commencement. And there's correspondence between Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass, where Booker T. is promising to pick him up at the train station and get him back to the train station so that he could make his next gig in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And the last known letter that Frederick Douglass wrote the night before he passed away, so this would have been February 19th, 1895 is the date of the letter, and it was a letter to Booker T. Washington offering his continued support and advice, which he, which he gave to Booker T. Uh, for many, many years. So they were friends, and little did they know that they would become relatives after they both passed away through the union of my grandparents that I just talked about. Now, I'm just curious how that legacy affected you as a young person. Was it something you ran from or embraced or was curious about or didn't know? A combination of all of that. Um, I did spend most of my life uh, running away for, from the legacy for many reasons, but I, I just remember, and you started talking about the images, and I spent all of my summers in Frederick Douglass's summer beach house, which was built on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay in a place called Highland Beach, Maryland. It was built by my great great grandfather Charles, who was Frederick and Anna Murray Douglass's youngest son. And Charles had purchased some acreage 
about 40 acres and he parceled them off and sold them away. And he kept one to build a house for himself, one for his brother, and then one for his father, Frederick, as a retirement home. And he asked his dad, are there any special features that you want in the house? And Frederick said, yes, I want there to be a tower at the top and I want it to point in a certain direction because what he wanted to do at the end of his life was to sit in that tower, look back across the water, back across the Chesapeake Bay. And on the other side, you can see land. And that land is the eastern shore of Maryland where he had been born into slavery with the name Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. And he never wanted to forget where he had come from, even though he had been born into this horrific institution of slavery. And in that house, I spent all of my summers there for probably till I was about 18 years old. And in every room, there were images of my ancestors. And I started to notice when I was about five or six that my, my ancestors were on statues. <laughs> and, and they were on money and bill they they were on stamps postage yeah. stamps they were there were schools named for them bridges libraries and everywhere i turned i started to feel like i was living in this long vast shadow of two very influential figures in american history and i you know i really didn't embrace it when i was younger because the few times that i told people of my relationship i would tell my friends or my classmates and nobody ever believed me and so I never thought that it was a point worth arguing. And then I had also seen what the pressure had done to those that came before me. And so I really was, as I described, decisively disengaged from my lineage until Providence called in my life. In what form did it come and how, how did it change you? It came in 2005 when I read a National Geographic magazine and the cover story was 21st century slaves. And it was an article about human trafficking and modern day slavery existing all over the world, including right here in the United States. And that article really just struck me squarely between the eyes. And I had heard about sex trafficking, which you know I thought ha happened in faraway places. And so I really started to, to research this issue. And then there was one night that really changed the whole trajectory of my life. And I was reading another article about a 12 year old girl who was forced to be a sex slave in the brothels of Southeast Asia and service countless men almost every single day. And down the hallway, I could hear my girls getting ready for bed. And my older daughter was 12 and my younger daughter was nine. So my older daughter, Jenna, was the same age as this girl that I was reading about. And when I walked in to say goodnight to them, you know, when they were laughing and playing and, and about to get tucked safely into bed and my mind is just racing and I can't wrap my brain around what I'm reading about this 12 year old girl in Asia and what I'm hearing from my daughters. And when I walked in, I couldn't look them in the eyes and I really didn't feel like I could look them in the eyes and walk away and not do something about this. And it was almost immediately that everything just started welling up inside of me. And I understood that I did have this platform that my ancestors had built through struggle and through sacrifice. And perhaps we could leverage the historical significance of my ancestry to do something about this issue. And so we started thinking, my mom and I, about Frederick Douglass's legacy as the great abolitionist and Booker T. Washington's legacy as the great educator. Aha, abolition through education. We can combine those, those legacies because both of my ancestors understood from a very young age that education was going to be their pathway to freedom, although we know it was illegal to teach an enslaved person to read and write. You know, when I think about Frederick Douglass, firstly, I consider him the greatest person, without a doubt, of the 19th century, certainly in the American experience. I mean, the whole trajectory of his life is so incredible. It it's almost defies belief. But both him and Booker T. Washington, as I look back on their lives from, from where I sit, are classic examples, as is Abraham Lincoln, of these self-invented Americans through their own will and fierce strive to, to learn and educate themselves. They completely invented themselves out of the circumstances from which they were born into. Frederick Douglass, when you consider that he was born into slavery, and I agree, I agree with you, um, and coming from that, that institution where he would literally have to steal his education and, and teach himself to read and write, and, and the work that we do at Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives around human trafficking prevention education is built on really one story in Frederick Douglass's life when he was about eight or nine and he was chosen from among all of the children on the plantation of the Eastern Shore of Maryland to go to Baltimore to be the house servant for his master's family. 
And the importance of that move was he was leaving in an environment where he wasn't around people where he could learn to read and write. And he was going to be in the big city. He would be around free black children and around poor white children. But what happened most importantly, when he got there, his slave mistress had never had a slave before and didn't know that it was illegal to teach him to read and write. And she had a young son that she was teaching. And alongside her son was Fred, bright eyed and eager to learn. And then really his first act of self-liberation in my mind was when he asked her to teach him and she began to teach him his letters, his ABCs. And that was all he needed was that little spark of light into his mental bondage. And the lessons would continue for a while until his enslaver, Hugh Auld, found out about him. And you know the story. He got angry and he looked at Frederick and he looked at his wife and he said, as Frederick wrote later, you cannot teach a slave how to read and write because if you do, it will unfit him to be a slave. And Frederick heard that message loud and clear, and he knew right then and there that education equals liberation, education equals emancipation, education equals freedom, and he would teach himself to read and write. And then to your point about really being a self-made man, you know, he had to be because he was living at a time when his federal government said it was legal to own him and illegal to teach him. And he was not getting any support from the government. His people were not. So he had to have a message of being a self-made man, which was his message later in life. But if you look at his whole story and, and just how he evolved from being an enslaved person for the first 20 years of his life, escaping slavery with the help of my great, great, great grandmother, Anna Murray, who is right. really an important piece to the story. And she's often overlooked and pushed to the side in history and not treated with the dignity and respect that she deserved. They were married for 44 years. They had five children together and 21 grandchildren. She was one of the first people to plant the seed of thought in his mind while he was enslaved. And she was a free woman in Baltimore working as a domestic servant. She said, Frederick, you're not meant to be a slave for life. And as they were started to think about having a family together or future together, she said, Frederick, I don't want our children's father to be a slave. Had she not sold her personal belongings to help finance his escape? Had she not sewn the sailor's disguise that he would wear? Who knows if he would have had the courage or the wherewithal to run away from slavery? And had that not happened, we would be a very different country sitting here today without the contributions of Frederick Douglass as the great abolitionist and an advisor to President Lincoln, the first African-American nominated for vice president of the United States, right. first African-American U.S. Marshal, first African-American recorder of deeds in the District of Columbia, Columbia. first African-American ambassador and council general to Haiti, and the first African-American to have a statue dedicated in his honor in 1899 in Rochester, New York. And so with all of that, um, it changed the course of history for all of us. Yeah, most definitely. And the woman uh, was Sophia, was his first tutor, I believe, Sophia Ald, who was part of the extended family from the Y plantation. And then they had a family home in Baltimore, which was a port city. All the influences of the world were coming through Baltimore at that time, only a stone's throw from the nation's capital. It's such an incredible legacy. I'm going to just read some, just some of the things you actually mentioned, but this is for the people that don't really have a handle on Frederick Douglass, I'm just going to list some of his accomplishments or his life journey because he was a slave. He was a fugitive. He was an abolitionist, the most powerful abolitionist in the pre-Civil War period, the most dynamic speaker that anyone had ever heard. He throttled audiences. I could only think of my own career as a comedian and, and what that must have been like touring from city to city, from town to town, relentlessly, not only in America, but in Europe. He became an international celebrity. He was an orator extraordinaire. His speeches are not only the greatest speeches that were ever expressed. The Gettysburg Address, the second inaugural, fine. Go reread Frederick Douglass's speech across his whole life from his July 4th speech before emancipation all the way to his reaction as a constitutional scholar across his life as, as, a, as, a, as a diplomat and ultimately as even an American imperialist as he was trying to secure bases for America in, in the Caribbean, uh, Santo Domingo. He was a best-selling author. His own life was the most incredible canvas that anyone could ever imagine. His life was his art. His writings rank with the best writings of the century, whether it's Nathaniel Hawthorne or Mark Twain, it's just compelling reading. I recommend people to read the Blight biography, which is fantastic. But 
read Frederick Douglass's works. It's incredible literature in and of itself. As a matter of fact, and I, I would like for you to comment on this, I felt like Blight was struggling to get beyond the, the actual biography that, that Frederick had laid down for himself because it was so incredible. I mean, it's just awesome. So he's like the greatest author of the 19th century. I don't want to go on, but he was a constitutional scholar. His interpretation of the constitution was at once brilliant and rocked the world and throttled the American consciousness. He was a businessman. He was a publisher, the North Star. He published a newspaper that was, I mean, the, the scope of his life is just, he was a world traveler. He was a father. Uh, and it seemed like from what I read, it was a very complicated family life that he, he lived on many levels. He was a recruiter for the U.S. Army. His rivalry uh, or his his mentorship, and I want you to talk about this with William Lloyd Garrison, and then who he ultimately has to separate himself from, and then as a recruiter for the U.S. Army during the Civil War, and then as a banker, a federal marshal, a woman's rights advocate. The tragedy that the thirteenth, fourteenth amendments did not include women and their right to vote was something that that was would tormented him. I mean. Diplomat, consul general, vice presidential candidate, American imperialist. This guy's life, it, it's amazing. And it's that gene, those genes are in you, Ken. How do you deal with it? His blood absolutely does flow through my veins. And it's something that I do pinch myself every day. And I will add to that very long list that you read that he was a real estate investor. And he was also the most photographed American of the 19th century photographed more than President Lincoln, more than Ulysses S. Grant, more than General Custer, and his only contemporaries in the world that were photographed more than he was, was the British royal family. And that's because he understood at the age of 22, only two years removed from slavery, that this new technology that he would come of age with, photography, he could use to help make his arguments for liberation and equality in addition to his oratory and his writings. And so he was very strategic in the way he presented himself as a man worthy of freedom, worthy of citizenship, because he was trying to counteract in the public consciousness this notion that people of African descent were not worthy of freedom and perhaps they were better off in slavery, making a group of people and other to justify taking away their freedom, treating them inhumanely. And they would say things like they're not even human beings. Um, they're getting the Christian religion. They're getting some measured care while enslaved listen to the happy songs that they're singing. And Frederick said that he never wanted to look like a happy, amiable fugitive slave. And that's why when you think about all of these images of him, he's always got that fiery, steely glare that he's looking directly into the camera and saying, when you look into my eyes, you're going to see a man and, and you're going to see somebody to be reckoned with. And he was a fashion trendsetter as well. You know, think about the way that he always dressed and how his hairstyle was uh, constantly changing and he his facial hair was changing. And at one point he had mullets. Um, at another point, he came back from France and he was dressed as a Parisian in the photograph and he's got a ponytail. So he was he was way ahead of his time in, in a lot of areas. But when you mention David Blight, who is a, a longtime family friend and he sits on our board and um, throughout the process of him writing that book, which took him 10 years, I remember when he started writing it and he would tell me, yep, I'm part halfway through the first chapter. OK, I'm starting the second chapter. And I heard his progress uh, for 10 years working on the book. And of course, it comes out and it wins the Pulitzer Prize. And it's, you know, the, the best biography that is that has ever been written, in my opinion, about Frederick Douglass. But it's a struggle trying to put all of that you know, into a book. But what I love that David said, David wrote a blurb for our book, which um, in 2018, we published a special bicentennial edition of Frederick Douglass's first autobiography, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. And I can, I'll talk about a project in, in just a moment. But the blurb that David wrote for us, he said the greatest gift that Frederick Douglass gave to his country was his story. And I think that's what you are kind of alluding to, because he wrote the three best-selling autobiographies he wrote thousands of essays and articles in his papers, and he also wrote a novella, a fiction book called The Heroic Slave. Right. And he was a very talented writer, we know, but a talented fiction writer. And I would have loved to have seen him write more in, in that genre. But he was he was a, a renaissance man. 
truly a renaissance man. Yeah, I look at those early daguerreotypes before even photography in its modern form has taken hold. And he's just looking down through the centuries. And the feeling I get when I look at those photographs is he's the first modern person. He just feels like he's at the point of the spear of modernity. We spend a lot of time in schools with the work that we do with the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. And I always tell this story about the photographer, uh, the photography and, and the impact that it had on me when I was young. And in that beach house that, that I talked about where I spent all of my summers, there was this larger than life portrait of Frederick Douglass at the top of the stairs. And again, I remember being about five or six years old and one night looking at that and thinking, man, you look mean. Uh, because I didn't understand as a boy, his strategy and why he took photographs in the way that he did. But I just remember thinking, man, you look mean. And I'm glad I didn't know you. And as I would try and sneak past the portrait or tiptoe past it, his eyes would follow me. <laughs> and <laughs> by the time I would get down to the end of the hallway, I could feel that steely glare burning like fire on the back of my neck. And I always imagined in my little boy imagination, this bellowing baritone voice, which he was said to have had booming down upon my tiny person. And he would say, you will do great things, young man. And that's really when I started to, to feel the pressure uh, because I thought, hmm, I don't know if I want anything to do with any of that. <laughs> Where you spent these summers, was that on the actual property of the, the Y plantation? No. Yeah, the Y plantation is over the Bray, uh, the Bay Bridge on the eastern shore of Maryland. Highland Beach is on the other side okay. of the Chesapeake. So when you sit in the home, which is still there today, in the tower, you can look back across the water and then you'll see the eastern shore, which is the area where the Y house plantation is. Are there Y descendants to this day? Do yes, we... there are. And they still own own that home. And I've met met them and have visited the plantation a few times in my life. Most recently in 2018 was the last time I was there. Now, famously, at the end of his life, Frederick Douglass returns there. And I guess he has, I don't know if it's possible to reconcile, but some sort of recognition or final meeting with the slave owning patriarch of that plantation. It's a story that people, they talk a lot about and zero in on it. You know, a lot of things have been passed down in the family. So much of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington belong to the public. And uh, we do have stories that have been passed down and some of those we keep to ourselves. Uh, but the lessons of love and forgiveness, um, humility that have been passed down through the generation. And it's still remarkable to me that he could um, forgive his enslaver. And, and so the story that you talk about, and he even wrote a letter um, back to his old master, um, you know, explaining why he did what he did and not going as far as apologizing for naming him or making him this no notorious figure in <laughs> right. history. Uh, but it, it, it really tells us today that we need to treat everybody that we come into contact with with dignity and respect because you never know <laughs> what that person is going to become. I'm sure his enslaver never imagined that little Frederick Bailey would become Frederick Douglass. No way he could have imagined that. One of the periods of his life that really intrigued me was his emergence as a, as a celebrity in America uh, on behalf of abolition and the tensions that that brought up with his original patron, one of the great abolitionist himself, William Lloyd Garrison, in his newspaper, The Liberator. And it, it almost reminds me of like a star is born, a show business story. Right. I, I don't yeah. know, maybe you can shed some light on that, you know, because it's, it's, it, it's just very intriguing to me. Yeah, it's intriguing to me, too. And I, I love the story. So you you think about Frederick Douglass being enslaved for 20 years. And then when he did run away, there was no counseling um, there was no post-traumatic stress disorder designation. He had to deal with the trauma of the brutality that he had suffered on his own. And at the age of 27, you, he, he's going from town to town, city to city, telling a story, as, as you mentioned earlier. And he started to have a problem. And that was people started to doubt that he had ever been a slave. They couldn't wrap their minds around what they thought a slave looked and sounded like and what they were seeing in this well-dressed, good-looking a uh, striking, charismatic, eloquent man. And so they started to call him a fraud. And in order to prove that he was who he claimed to be, he wrote that first autobiography, The Narrative. And in it, he named names and he named places. It shows the courage that he had. And then he had another problem. It became a bestseller. 
selling 4,500 copies in three months. And that's the last thing that you want is the notoriety of a best-selling book when you're trying to hide from your enslaver. It made him a celebrity, made him a household name, and it really put him in conflict with the Garrisonians and his quote unquote handlers around him because now he was really starting to uh, think for himself. It was suggested that he flee to Europe for a couple of years as a cooling off period and he would travel to Ireland and England and Scotland talking about the abolition of slavery in the United States and, and trying to raise money and gain supporters. He would land in this place called Newcastle upon Tyne and with the in England, and with the help of his uh, supporters there, they raised enough money to purchase his freedom from his master, and he was able to come back to the United States a free man. He and the family would settle in Rochester, New York, which is where he would begin to publish the North Star newspaper. And in 1848, he would attend the Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls and be the only man to speak at the convention and one of 32 men to sign the Declaration of Sentiment. So he was a lifelong supporter and fighter for, for women's rights. But when he was in Ireland, it was really transformative for him. He arrived in the midst of the potato famine, the Great Famine, and he saw people suffering that didn't look like him. And it really started to get him to think with an internationalist mindset and to begin to fight for human rights for everyone. And I think this is why when you do see him come back to the United States, he, he is speaking out already um, about women's rights. But while in Ireland, that transformation, he did a lot of thinking about what his philosophy was, um, what he thought about the Constitution, and, and starting to differ from what get the Garrisonians, um, how they viewed ha the abolition of slavery. And so the separation really happens when he's in Europe. He comes back and then he publishes a newspaper that's in direct competition as, as far as Gar William Lloyd Garrison thought with his paper, The Liberator. Garrison, as I understand it, embraced this idea that gains you know, a deeper expression in the next century with Gandhi that, that the, the solution to slavery was essentially going to be a nonviolent one, or they hoped it would be. And of course, with the rising tensions that preceded the Civil War, from what I understand, Frederick Douglass, you know, took a very different view of things and felt that the only path to liberation would be at probably the, the end of a, of a rifle. And that's something that in, intrigues me about his journey, is this departure from not only just the, the show business part of it, but also this philosoph philosophical divergence. The Garrisonians were talking about moral suasion as a way to get people to um, understand how horrible slavery was. And Frederick realized that that wasn't going to be enough. And of course, when we get into the years of, of the Civil War, he understood that the Civil War was about slavery. It wasn't about states' rights, and it needed to be a war about ending slavery. And that was really his importance at that time, in my opinion, was how he agitated and how he pushed Lincoln to eventually make the decision to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, or first to announce it in September 1862, and then 100 days later, sign it in January 1st, 1863. And we know from our history that that was a wartime measure, and it didn't free all of the people that were enslaved, only those that were in the states that had joined the Confederacy. But Lincoln, we know from our history, did not consider Black people equal to white. So you really had two questions. The question, slavery was morally wrong. Was it morally wrong? And then the second question, are Black people equal to, to white people? And to Lincoln's credit, he did evolve over time, and he eventually made the right decision. And we now look back at him as the great emancipator and perhaps give too much credit for one white man or five white men sitting around the table and freeing the slaves as, as if those that were enslaved didn't take on their own agency and work toward their own liberation. But the importance of Frederick Douglass during that time and during the Civil War um, can't be understated. And I, in fact, I have, I should have pulled it down, but in my closet, I have a notebook uh, that Frederick Douglass carried around in his pocket from 1863. And it was the book that he used to recruit black soldiers and to write their names down and in it he would write down a name george smith and next to it traitor or sam you know samuel smith 
um, deserter. And it's a really interesting book. And he's got, you know, a lot of notes in there. He's got his speaking schedule, his calendar, um, how much he was getting paid for some of the the uh, talks that he gave. And um, just, I think it's a really special artifact that we have in our family. Well, one of the things that doesn't get a lot of historical credit, and I when I read Du Bois's Reconstruction in America, it brought it to light, is while Frederick Douglass is busy recruiting Black men into the, the federal army, swelling the ranks after the Emancipation Proclamation, at the very same moment, there are draft riots in New York, uh, meaning white people, we don't want to go. Uh, the mortality was huge. The, 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 the roles of the dead were, were just astronomical, never been seen before, really, in American history. At the very same time as there are draft riots in New York, Black men are filling the ranks of the army and at the same time deserting the plantations. And that's really the critical kind of turning point. It doesn't get really enough credit. And, you know, and Frederick Douglass, from what I've read, seemed was a big part of that. It changed the balance of the war, having those 200,000 Black men fighting uh, for the Union Army. And two of his Frederick's first recruits were his own sons. Right. You know, talk about putting your money where your mouth is. And his first recruit into the Massachusetts 54th was my great great grandfather, Charles Frederick and Anna's youngest son. We, you had mentioned earlier about the family and, um, you know, perhaps the, the types of dynamics that go into families, especially when you've got somebody that is traveling around the world and is, is not home um, a lot. We're working very hard to change that narrative uh, because it's it's frankly um, not true that the family was not um, a part of the work that he did. They were a very important part of it. The Douglas family was a radical freedom fighting collective um, in their own right. And Anna, as I mentioned earlier, was a, a feminist and a radical freedom fighter. She's been portrayed as somebody that perhaps stayed in the kitchen or in the garden. We were working with a scholar at the University of Edinburgh, Celeste Marie Bernier, who has five volumes of books uh, coming out in the first part of next year, where she's transcribed more than a thousand letters uh, between uh, children, children to their parents, grandchildren to their grandparents that talk about the importance of the Douglas family. And so getting back to the Civil War and the rec recruitment, Lewis uh, who was Frederick's oldest son, and then Fred Jr. and Charles. Charles and Lewis both uh, were in the Massachusetts 54th. The sons really informed their father on what was happening on the front lines, on, on the ground, and um, really provided a lot of information that would help him make decisions that he needed to make when he was having conversations with Abraham Lincoln and, and many others. So the family were working hard to really uh, change that narrative. And uh, so stay tuned in the coming months um, about a lot of information that's going to come out. Now, the Massachusetts 54th was the, the, the regiment that was memorialized in the movie Glory. Is that correct? And they were down there in South Carolina and they had an assault on a fort and the, the mortality was terrible. But I believe they prevailed. But that's the same regiment. Is that That's the same reg regiment. Um, the Battle of Fort Wagner on Morris right. Island in Charleston Harbor. And in fact, Lewis was in that battle and was injured. He was shot in the hip and he wrote a letter back to his parents and also to his fiance, Am Amelia, talking about how bravely the men fought and that he had been injured and developed gangrene in his groin and almost died. And so when he would eventually get, make it back to New York, Frederick would sit by his bedside uh, for two weeks until he recovered from, from his wounds and from his injuries. But he fought bravely in that battle. I, I, when I think about, <laughs> about the movie Glory, Frederick Douglass, the way he was portrayed was as the, the white-haired, graying statesman, when at that time he would have been about 45 or 46 years old. But people, when they visualize Frederick Douglass, a lot of times they think about that prophet that's looking away from the camera, that grandfatherly figure, not the radical freedom fighter. And so I think it's interesting in that movie that they didn't portray him as the age that he actually was. Right. He was almost at the height of his powers physically and otherwise at that moment. Were there black officers? I don't know if Lincoln allowed for black officers or not, but- um, Eventually um, there, there were, um, you know, they could move up into the ranks, but that was a struggle as well. And 
Frederick would fight for equal pay, um, equal equipment for black soldiers. Uh, but that was all, you know, part of the, the work that needed to be done. I think the, the most misunderstood and compelling periods of American history is famously called Reconstruction, where there was so much promise, so much heartbreak at the same time. And of course, you've got the three pivotal amendments, 13, 14, and 15, right in those 10 year period. And Frederick Douglass is right there in the midst of, of this incredible political struggle. And it seems to me at this moment, he kind of drifts as this outside agitator into a really a political figure within the Republican Party. And that to me was astonishing considering from where he came from. I don't know. Yeah, that's so something that I'm, I'm sure you took away from uh, David Blight's book, that he was an outsider at one point and who became an insider and uh, this political figure. Now, when the home, their home in Rochester was burned down by arson in 1872, mm -hmm. that's when the family moved to Washington, D.C. So now they're right in the heart of you know all of the political activity and he's getting older and he understands that there was still a lot of work that needed to be done just because four million enslaved africans had been freed in 1865 that didn't mean that there wasn't work still to be done and we're still seeing uh, the remnants of of all of that 400 years of oppression and enslavement today my great grandmother who lived to be 103 years old. She met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl. She didn't know that she was going to grow up and marry his grandson, Joseph, but that's what happened. And when I was in that summer beach house, my great grandmother was there and I would sit at her knee and she would tell me firsthand stories about Frederick Douglass. And then my aunt Portia was Booker T. Washington's daughter and she lived to be 95. And I remember sitting at her knee and she would tell me firsthand stories about her father and so I can say, even with all of those greats, that I stand one person away from each man, I stand one person away from history, and I stand one person away from slavery. And so here we are today with a lot of work still to be done. Uh, we're dealing with the vestiges of all of that oppression over so many years. That's work that we continue to do at the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. So you had firsthand person-to-person -person conversations with individuals that also had firsthand person-to-person, eyeball-to-eyeball conversations with these two titanic figures in American history. And hands that touched the great Frederick Douglass and hands that touched the great Booker T. Washington also touched mine. And my great-grandmother would call Frederick Douglass the man with the great big white hair because that's what she remembered when she met him as an eight-year-old girl. And she would talk about his great big smile and um, you know, it's just how tall he was and how imposing of a figure he was. And so, yes, I have a people that were in my life that, that knew them. You know, one of the things is I try to imagine Frederick Douglass speaking is that he had to have been hilarious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great sense of humor. He had to be able to rock a room. I mean, I, I've done stand up most of my adult life and the, the feeling when you stand in front of people. Now, he didn't have microphones, but it's a kind of power you have without authority. In other words, you're not vested a, a position to wield power. It's the power that you can exercise through the strength of your wit and your presence and your mind and your body. And I can only imagine what a full dynamo he must have been when he walked on stage in front of mostly white audiences across the North. He might as well have been coming from Mars, like to see <laughs> yeah. a black person embodying all these, I mean, I think of, I, I mean, I, I can sense it from my own challenges as a comedian, but also like what it must've been for him and just a whirlwind, the dynamo he must've been in the 1840s and 30s and 50s. Like, what is this? I, I can only imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was an entertainer for sure. That was the entertainment. You know, he can get up in front of a, a crowd for hours, three, four hours, and he sang, um, he spoke, he told jokes, he did, um, you know, various dialects, he imitated people. He was um, a brilliant uh, performer in addition to everything else that he uh, contributed to, to the world. And I, I think about that uh, a lot as well, just to imagine, you know, what would it be like to uh, be able to be in a room with him 
And um, it, I remember being, uh, David Blight had invited me to come to Yale to speak at a conference many years ago. And the, these were all historians and Douglas scholars that were there. And, and one of the questions that I was asked is, if you were to meet Frederick Douglass, what would you, you say to him or what would you do? And the first thing that came to my mind was I would walk up to him, give him a hug, tell him how much I love him, tell him how much, how proud I am of him. And all of the scholars were just like aghast. They were like, no, no, Mr. Douglas, you know, you, you wouldn't touch Mr. Douglas, but I'm coming to it from a different place. You know, he's my family. And right. so, yeah, I don't know why I thought of that, but that was, that was funny. Well, I bet he would want to hug you too. I, I would, I know that he would. Yes. One of the things that struck me about Frederick Douglass, especially towards the post-Civil War period in his life, going through Reconstruction and beyond, which was an incredible tragedy, Reconstruction. So many of the hopes that were articulated in these uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment in reality were crushed. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems to me that when you read his speeches, he's able to look across the horizon and see the possibility of a multicultural functioning democracy. He seemed to have a sense for that possibility. We're still struggling for it today. Maybe we're closer to it than we're, we were before. Obviously, Obama is a, an expression of that wish. And that, that always struck me about Douglas in the latter stages of his life, this capacity to just seemingly look over the horizon. It's remarkable. And it wasn't just the latter stages of his life. It was the earlier stages as well, too. He always had this hopeful vision. You mentioned his Fourth uh, of July speech, What to the Slave is Your Fourth of July, uh, delivered in 1852 on July 5th in Rochester, New York at Corinthian Hall. And that speech was really broken up into three parts. Uh, the first part, you know, he talked about the founding fathers and and the ideals and, and how oppression will make a wise man mad. And then in the middle of it, he just rails into his audience. And there were 600 people there. Keep in mind, these were his supporters. These were anti-slavery people. And he just rails in to them um, and talking about the hypocrisy of espousing the ideals of freedom and justice and liberty while enslaving people on your blood drenched soil. And he what to the slave is your Fourth of July. And he said that this country was guilty of practices that would disgrace a na nation of savages at this very hour. And at the end of the speech, he ended on a hopeful note. You know, there, there were speeches that he gave when he was younger where he said, I have no love for my country. But what he was doing was he was criticizing his country because he loved the country. And because he believed that we could live up to those founding ideals. And so his hopeful vision that he carried throughout his life, in spite of everything that he went through and everything that he accomplished and everything that he had suffered and everything that he endured, he still had this hopeful vision. And I think that that's so beautiful. Now, at the very end of his life, his wife dies and he remarries a white woman, which I can only imagine what an incredibly revolutionary act that must have been <laughs> for him. I, I wonder how that even vibrated across his own family. I mean, I'm, I'm curious what you know about that or, you know, what, what's to be said. Well, he, he received uh, criticism for, for that. Now, Anna Murray, who was his first wife and my great, great, great grandmother, as I mentioned, they were married for 44 years and then she fell ill in their home in Washington, D.C. She passed away. And Frederick went into a year long depression mourning her death. And then it would be a couple of years later that he would marry Helen Pitts, who, as you said, was a white woman. And that was something that she had received a pushback from her family. He received pushback from his family and his own children because it was something that just did not happen. But again, it, it shows me here was a man that you weren't, first of all, you weren't going to be able to control. Everything that he had been through in his life, you know, he deserved. He said, I think he said, you know, my my first wife was the color of my mother and my, my second wife was the color of my master, my enslaver. Right. There, there's a sense of humor there again. But you weren't going to tell him what to do. And he was going to do what he wanted to do. And, and he fell in love with the person that he fell in love with. And, and then Helen became very important. The reason that the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site 
exists in Washington, D.C. and is managed by the National Park Service was because the vision that Helen had, she looked at Mount Vernon and she looked at Montecito and she believed that that home could be the same type of legacy uh, for Frederick Douglass. And so she started the first and oldest Frederick Douglass organization called the Frederick Douglass Memorial and Historical Association, uh, which still exists today. Now, one of the tragedies of Reconstruction, of course, in my mind, is the failure for the 40 acres and a mule or some kind of reimbursement. That tragedy is just fundamental to the legacy of misfortune that followed to me, that somehow there was no Reparation. Reparation. Thank mm-hmm. you. My mother received reparations from Germany as a, a refugee from Hitler, but no black person got a dime. And after that, black people were basically consigned to, you know, a different kind of feudalism, you know, at least agriculturally, tenant farming. Another chapter in his life was he was head of the Freedmen's Bank, which mm-hmm. sadly uh, had its own issues. But yeah, I'd like you to just talk about that if you could. This country was built off of the backs of enslaved Africans. And 400 years, as I mentioned earlier, of oppression and enslavement. And then there was no plan for emancipation. You you had 4 million people plus that were freed. Many didn't know how to read and write. Many spent the first couple of years, two, three years, trying to reconnect with family that they had been separated from. They didn't own land. They didn't, you know, own houses. They, They just really had the burlap on their their backs. And also think about the generational trauma that was passed down that's in our DNA, those of us that are descendants of people that were enslaved. There was no counseling. There was no, as I said earlier, when I was talking about Frederick Douglass and the trauma that he endured, there was no post-traumatic stress disorder designation. And so you had these people that really, you know, had to make a way for themselves. And then that's when Booker T. Washington comes in and his importance in starting and founding Tuskegee Normal School and Institute because he understood that education for formerly enslaved people needed to start at the basics. You couldn't start reaching for the higher aims in life until you could meet your basic needs in life. And that was his philosophy. So Tuskegee, the education there started sometimes with hygiene, teaching them a trade, how to farm the land, how to make dresses, how to make bricks so that they could build their own school because he understood coming out of that enslavement that you weren't going to get people to just change their racist ideology overnight. And so what he showed was he showed black people how they could change themselves, how they could overcome obstacles, develop strength of character and rise by their own efforts to honorable positions of respect, but most importantly, self-esteem. So Washington was a leader who brought stability in a time of transition from enslavement to freedom. And it may be said that he's the person that bridged the gap between the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and the civil rights movement. And we talked before we came on air about the debate between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. And, you know, they had different philosophies because they came from different worlds. Booker T. was born into slavery and he came from the fields with a till under his arms. And Du Bois was born free and he came from the city with books under his arms. And so it was natural that they were going to work in different ways for the advancement of their people. And one worked from the top down in Du Bois and the other worked from the bottom up in Washington and advancement met in the middle. And so they were both right. There was not one way to go about, you know, this type of work. Right. And as a historian, Du Bois, he was also a giant. I mean, for many, many, many reasons, but just his books in terms of my, my, the one that just rocked my world was Reconstruction in America because it really broadened my view of this narrative. And one of the things that seemed like this was a little bit of a rivalry, I guess, or a philosophical clash between Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, we see that sort of in the latter stages of the 20th century when you have people like Martin Luther King, a son of the South, and then also Malcolm X and yeah. others. And this it's a similar kind of clash, and they do kind of meet in the middle, in my view. And then you had Frederick Douglass later in life that the young ones coming up were trying to knock him off the pedestal. So that's just the nature of, of how these things work. But, you know, I'm just really proud of this history and that I am able to continue the work of my ancestors through the Frederick Douglass family initiatives. And in addition to doing human trafficking prevention education work in K through 12 schools, we also do work around 
racial equity. Uh, we do legacy building. We're also working on a project in Rochester to build a Frederick Douglass Museum Center because there's no place that you can go to in Rochester to really learn about his life. You would have to visit sites that were significant in his life there, uh, where he's buried at Mount Hope Cemetery, the Talman Building where he published a North Star newspaper. You can visit, visit 13 statues that we helped erect in his bicentennial year in 2018, do a walking tour or a driving tour. So we're really excited about this museum project. It's going to be a four to five year project. We're working with the city of Rochester and Monroe County and working with the state um, legislatures to be able to uh, find the money to be able to build this. Quick question. Uh, do original copies of the North Star exist? Most of those were lost in the fire the arson fire at the home in Rochester, New York, but there are digital uh, copies that exist, um, I believe in the Frederick Douglass papers of the Library of Congress. And because we can digitize all of these types of things, you can really do a Google search and find, you know, a lot of, of what you'd be looking for. Well, Kenneth, uh, there's, this is a conversation that could probably just go on forever. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking forward to finding out and discovering more about Frederick Douglass. It sounds like you guys have some familial possessions that might even shed more light on, on their lives and his life. Yeah, I, I have some things here. In fact, on the floor behind me, um, there's, you know, it's starting to pile up. And, and we're hopeful, you know, a lot of the artifacts, I, you know, I mentioned that Frederick Douglass belongs to the world and, and a lot of our family artifacts are out there and some, some of these are in private collections. And it's my hope that as we put together the plans for the museum center, that some of these artifacts will make their way back to the family and we'll be able to display them and to be able to tell the story, especially to the next generation um, of leaders. You know, Frederick Douglass had a great quote. He said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And I would add to that broken women. And at our organization, that's in our mission statement is, is building strong children through education and the legacies that both of my ancestors have left us. Well, congratulations for picking your ancestors, you know? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, you, when you're, before you're born, you have a choice. You pick your ancestors. And, and, and you know, you, you don't necessarily know their importance before you pick your ancestors, but you just like rolled the, the all-time great, you know, just royal flush of ancestors. So. Well, it, 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 it definitely is a blessing, but it also can be a burden as well to carry the weight of expectation. But I think because I found this mission on my own and it wasn't forced on me, it's more meaningful. Meaningful. So I feel uh, very fortunate to uh, have their blood flowing through my veins. Yes. And also, the, it just seems too like it's a, a legacy of a certain kind of privilege, uh, too, just because I don't know how, what the, how, you know, the building blocks of your family to this present moment, but you can see alternative histories where people had nothing, followed mm -hmm. by nothing, followed by less. And yeah. it's hard to escape these generational legacies for the good or, or the bad. So congratulations on keeping it alive and giving it a rebirth. I want to just thank you for doing a rebel without applause. I, I love this stuff, you know, and yeah, I, I can tell this. you do you're passionate about it. And I, I appreciate you having me on and, and perhaps we can do it again uh, somewhere down the road. Yeah. Let, let's keep, keep it alive. And you're, you're here in Southern California. I had no idea. I thought you were in Rochester or, you know, in Maryland or something like that. One other thing about, it just occurred to me with what's going on in the Ukraine and this mass exodus of people, many of whom are young children and women mm -hmm. dispossessed without their homes, the prospect and danger of this kind of human trafficking is even worse with the catastrophe of wars and dislocation and refugees. So. Oh, absolutely. Because you have children that are uh, separated from their families and, and women and children become more vulnerable anytime, you know, there's war, war torn countries or some sort of natural disaster. And so we really have to, you know, be thinking about that with these refugees that are being displaced at, at such high numbers. Our work has always been on the prevention side uh, not working on the back end after the victimization occurs or after the crime occurs, but reducing the vulnerability uh, for young people to be in traffic through through education. And that's that's where our work is focused. And we also do legislative work at the federal level. Uh, the Frederick Douglass Trafficking Victims Prevention and Protection Act is the piece of federal legislation that guides how the federal government responds to human trafficking domestically 
and internationally. And we've been um, instrumental in being able to write primary prevention into that legislation, which from there, actual and appropriation of funds distributed through the Department of Health and Human Services for primary prevention education in the classroom. And for us, that work is done in K through 12 schools. Well, congratulations on your great work. Check out this new great documentary on HBO. It's what's it called? Five Speeches? Or... Frederick Douglass and Five Speeches. It's streaming on HBO Max. Yes, Frederick Douglass and Five Speeches. You can see Kenneth in his full glory. Uh, and... Well, as long as we're plugging things here, I also want to mention uh, the Abraham Lincoln series, three-part series on the History Channel, which I participated in that. And then there was another 1,000 Years of Slavery on the Smithsonian channel, channel, and all of those aired in February, but you can stream those on the various platforms. Another chapter to this whole conversation is Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Ulysses Grant, Frederick Douglass, Rutherford B. Hayes. He had relationships with American yeah. presidents. I mean, it just goes on. It's just like amazing story. But uh, well, maybe we can get into that at another time. I just want to thank you again for this conversation. I really appreciate it. And folks, till next time, namaste, shalom, and aloha. By that, I mean, you know, namashaloha. See ya.